Welcome to Hardware Addicts, a proud member of the Destination Linux Network. Hardware Addicts is the podcast that focuses on the physical components that power our technology world. In this episode, we're going to take a look at Intel's new processor that's hitting the market. You're going to be super excited about this one, or not. We're also going to discuss their unfortunate announcement of more delays to the 7 nanometer lineup, along with some leadership changes they have going on. But then we're going to head to the popular camera corner with Wendy, where we're going to discuss a big announcement coming from Olympus. So sit back, relax, and plug in, because Hardware Addict starts now. I'm Ryan, your tech guide through the universe, and with me today are my two co-hosts, Wendy, our resident photographer extraordinaire and hardware enthusiast, along with Michael, the software sage and hardware padawan. Let's find out what tech adventures everyone has had this week. Michael, we're going to start with you. Yay! I actually am happy because I did hardware stuff today. Or not today, but like this this week, and I got even more hardware coming, so I'm going to have at least the next couple of episodes where I actually have hardware things to talk about. And I'm super excited to finally participate. Yay. Anyway, so I got a camera. I talked about this last time. And, uh, and, but it hadn't shipped yet. So I was, you know, like the whole joke about how long I sometimes take to open boxes and all that, which is very true. I typically do. I opened this box on day one. Well, I was so is this proud a of Kodak, myself. Kodak, um, disposable camera or what? No, oh, no, no, no. It was actually, <laughs> it was, uh, I'm so, I'm such a professional photographer person. So I right. got a Sony A6100 because I asked Wendy what to get. And it Wendy, was, why great did you choice. let him get one above my camera? I have the A5100 and you give him advice to go above my camera. That's rude. Well, we're constantly playing this game of who's got the better kitchen system. Me. So I figured, might as well help <laughs> Michael out so he can one up you in the camera this department. This is getting ridiculous. All yeah, right. we have to create. A, we're going to create a competition <laughs> for every single type of hardware, uh, and usually I'll lose. But this time, yay! It's actually kind of funny because I got this on day one. I was like, "Oh, this is so awesome!" Okay, I got my microphone, I got my SD card, and I hook up the microphone, and it doesn't work. It doesn't have the right connector. Okay, I hook up. I hooked. I, I put in the SD card, and uh, it's the wrong class for the SD card so it can't handle the full quality. So I took it out day one and couldn't use it because I needed some more stuff to make it so work You did better. no research. You just listened to whatever <laughs> Wendy told you to buy. And That's not to, true. Tried to jam your old crap you had. No, 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 no. I actually found out that this particular camera like models si- system is completely confusing because you had the A5100. That's not like the right before mine at any way. It's years before. There's the yep. A6, there's the A6000, there's the A6100, 6300, 6500, and 6600, and 6400. I forgot about that one. Now, the weird thing is that the 6100 Numbers. is newer than everything else except for the 6600. It makes no sense. I'm so on it Amazon goes on right now looking at the 6600. It's going to hit by. Yeah. Must be. Okay. The, the 6600 is actually probably too, too over the top. But the 6400 is, t- is is the better camera overall. Uh, I got the 6100 because the, it's like saving four hundred dollars. But yeah. the the and I also got it with like a really good deal with like a kit lens built into it and the price of a brand new without without the lens. So I was like, I I kind of have to do this. But I was looking at the thing and I learned so much about this and I learned that the it it starts with six thousand sixty three and sixty five, and then there's a whole new series that's sixty one, sixty four, and sixty six, which makes no sense. And how complicated! Like there was no way I was going to make an accurate thing without research. So your joke about how I didn't research is completely ridiculous because I hundred percent did after I had already ordered it when Wendy told me <laughs> to get it, and then I found out all this stuff. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Well, the best part was he goes, is this a good one? And I looked at the listing. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Especially where it says it's open box. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Said somebody bought it and returned it. So it's practically brand new. But you get it at a discount because somebody bought it and opened it. Right. Yeah. I'm really good at software. I just want to make that clear to people. It's not that I'm competent <laughs> on everything. It's just hardware so far. <laughs> But it's fun. It's fun well, to have somebody who hasn't been in the hardware. You've just kind of gone about on the show because then you ask the questions that other people who have, 
don't have addiction problems like Wendy and I uh, would be asking. So I think it's good. Yeah, I I, well, I think that I'm very important. That you're, <laughs> if it's not a hardware you're familiar with, then it's also going to take a little more research and having somebody that you can reach out to and say, hey, what is this and what's going on? That that definitely helps. I mean, a that's lot. a really good point, Wendy, because a lot of times, even though I have tons of different hardware, people ask me questions about something that I don't have the current research on, like a yeah. monitor or a specific, you know, item that maybe is something I haven't played with, like eGPUs, for instance, that I got into recently. You know, outside of this recent exposure, I've not really used them, so I wouldn't be an expert in it. Yeah, and I do think it's kind of funny because you're talking about like it's good to have someone to go to and all that, and and it's not like I trusted blindly. I didn't just, I've been asking Wendy for advice for a while. And then when I finally got to the point where I was like, I think this might be a good option. I'll ask Wendy. And then she said, yes, that's a great option, especially that I was like, oh, okay, cool. Then I trusted blindly completely. Yeah. At least she didn't go to Wendy and be like, listen, I got a $50 budget and I need a camera better than Ryan's. <laughs> yeah. I did not, I, like, I made it possible. Mm, you're out of luck. Yeah. I also think that she would, she would, uh, you know, be proud of me for also being frugal and trying to save as much money as possible while also getting the best camera I could. Yep, so absolutely. Was, that's what I'm all about. Get the best camera you can for the money that you've got to spend. Speaking of what you're all about, Wendy, what have you been up to this week? I have had pretty much a solid week of tech teardowns. Like I've been you. taking all kinds of stuff apart. I love it. So we led off with my in-laws laptop. This thing is 10 years old. And it wasn't powering on. I figured it was to the point that it was had gotten too hot. So they dropped it off with me, completely tore it down, replaced the thermal paste, pulled out the spinning rust, put in an SSD, got Linux reinstalled on it because it was already running Linux before. And now this 10-year-old computer with two-core, two-thread i5 is running super smooth. And even though they have the other system that I set up for them earlier this spring, this will be a nice one to have. So if one of them is looking at email, the other one can still play solitaire. Awesome work. And did you scream, it's alive! Just like Frankenstein? No, I didn't. But I'm always so happy when I put things back together and they work. Because I've had right. a situation this week where I put it back together and it didn't work. Uh-oh. <laughs> Mm. Look at there in just a second. The other thing I tore apart was we have a mini uh, projector that we've had for quite a few years and it was turning on and shutting off. So I figured, well, I'm just going to take it apart and see what's in it. And I've shared on my Instagram page the cutest little fan you ever did see. <laughs> this is like 26 millimeters. It is absolutely adorable. And so even though I'm not putting this projector back together, it's going on my my list of stuff to just kind of have my hardware that sits out. I love it. But the adorable fan has to be there. Sometimes you can't <laughs> fix them, but at least you can part them, and you never know when that part will come in handy one day. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just fun to see how things go together. So the, the part that actually has the lens on it and the projector is so stinking tiny. So the overall projector is mighty small. But it was just curious to pull it apart and see what that actual projector piece looks like and where all the parts go together. So it was a fun learning experience and not one that will ever come of it works again. The, the thing that I tore apart and the first time it didn't work was the original Xbox One nice. that we got this last week, which... <laughs> so, so when it... When it showed up, it had, you know, a little bit of a rattle to it. And I told my daughter, it's probably nothing. But if something has a rattle, I don't want it to be it's in the fan or something like that. So then we turn it on and it's absolutely destroyed. So I pulled it all apart and it was one of the, the posts or the case screws that for some reason was off. So I figured, yeah, I got it open. I will go ahead and put new thermal paste on it and all that kind of stuff. Got it put back together, and the first time I plugged it in, it started making all sorts of noises. So the the turn on, turn off sound was coming on and off, and I'm like, "What the heck? What is it?" Just thinking, well, maybe it's the power supply. I tore the power supply apart, and it it was mighty dirty. So the power supply fan 
And if you so if you've ever seen an Xbox One uh, power supply on it, there is a little fan to help cool it as well. So that was full of dust. Got that tore apart, cleaned out, and it was running better, but it was still randomly. I'd hear the the turn off sound, and it would just shut down. So I sent a message to Ryan. He's like, "Yeah, I think it's thermal." Like, yeah, you're you're probably right. Maybe I didn't put enough or or whatever. Tore it all back apart the next morning. The thermal paste looks good, but you know, of course, cleaned it off, reapplied, got it put back together. And as I'm reseating the cable, so that front little panel has the captive buttons. And as I'm reseating that cable, I'm like, oh my goodness, you dumb dumb, you probably didn't have it seated all the way in properly, and so it was messing with those front captive buttons, uh. especially the power one. Because once I got that reseated all back together, plugged it in, there was no instant all kinds of on-off sounds. Wasn't doing any of that. I actually had to push the front captive button to power it on. It hasn't randomly shut off. So the Thank lesson goodness. here is, yes, absolutely. The lesson here is make sure all of your cables are seated properly and that the front cables of an Xbox One is a ripping pain in the butt to get back in. This is true. And I think the best lesson <laughs> in this, though, is that you were willing to tear this thing apart and get in there and tear it apart multiple times, which, listen, when you're working on something for the first time and you finally mm -hmm. get it apart and you do all the work, you figure out how everything works, it takes a much, it takes a long time to do that. But then when you get in the second time, you still think about that first time and like, I don't want to do this again. And a lot of people give up at that point. But you went back in there, you tore it back apart, you found the solution, and now you got a working Xbox One, which is awesome. Yes. Quick story about to reference what Ryan just said. I did I took apart an Xbox three sixty because it red ringed and I did the thermal thing and I did all that stuff and then it red ringed again and I threw it away. <laughs> Sad. Hardware abuse. <laughs> Hardware abuse. Okay, technically I didn't throw it away. I just don't know where it is. I'm pretty sure I still have it somewhere. <laughs> it, it's set aside somewhere. But the best part of this whole thing is the kids were totally enthralled when I was taking apart stuff this week and putting it back together. We have an old Nintendo Wii that hasn't run for years. And I told them, you know, the problem, the reason why it probably doesn't run is it probably needs cleaned out too. We live in a really dusty part of Idaho. This is a desert. The wind blows all the time. It doesn't matter how much you clean. Dust is absolutely everywhere. So I looked up the instructions on how to take it apart on iFixit. And my kids actually started taking it apart themselves. I just stood back and said, yep, this is the next step. I was letting them take it apart. We have some Y screws that have been stripped. So I need a different Y screw a bit but after i get one of those and they can continue taking apart and that is that is their project to work on and if it goes back together and it works fantastic if it doesn't this is a lesson learned from them and they got to work on the project yeah i, I really want people to tear things apart and look inside and even if you can't fix it it's okay because you're learning something along the way of how the components connect you can go online and look for the design manuals and see if you can identify the different parts that are inside and just see how things are put together and a general understanding. Because honestly, once you start understanding how different devices work, they're all very similar. They're going to have power yeah. supplies and processors and fans and copper heat pipes and thermal paste and a lot of it is very similar in there. And so you once you start learning one, you're going to be more comfortable with any electronic you take apart. Absolutely. That actually sounds kind of perfect to what the email we got recently was. So, Ryan, tell us about that. I just love this email. I got so excited when I got this email that I sent it to you, Michael. And I'm like, look at this. This is the perfect email. <laughs> Somebody sent me an email and just said, hey, Ryan, I wanted to thank you for encouragement you gave me a couple of years ago. At the time, my son was learning to program an eight-year-old HP laptop whose fans went out. I asked you on Telegram how hard it would be to fix this ourselves. At first, you said it was an easy fix to change a fan until I gave you the model number. Then you said that we'd have to completely tear the laptop apart to get to the fan because I looked up the specific laptop they had and it was just designed terribly. But it would be a fun learning experience. So I was telling them, look, 
this is not an easy laptop to get into. You're going to have to remove pretty much everything to get to the part that you need to, but it's going to be a great learning experience if you do it. Well, they decided to do it and it worked. Worked for months and it was a great computer for his son to work on. Last week, I had a different HP laptop that would quickly ramp up to 62 degrees Celsius doing normal web surfing. I suspected that the fan needed to be cleaned, and since it was 11 years old, that the thermal paste needed to be replaced. Encouraged by the last experience, I took this one completely apart, replaced the paste. Fan and cooling fins were pretty clean, but blew those out and got it all back together, no cost other than time. Other than a sticky battery release switch, probably didn't get a wire routed just right or a screw is too tight, the laptop stays nice and cool, often 12 or more degrees cooler and a much slower fan speed than before. And the reason is because manufacturers put really crappy thermal paste on the machines in general. Like if you go and get a new HP or Dell and things, it just depends on the caliber that you get. But most of the time, the thermal paste they use is subpar. So you would have probably have seen a difference even if you'd gotten the machine brand new, tore it apart, and put new thermal paste on it than what was their stock. Um, they go on to say, thanks for your positive encouragement and the positive voice you've been in the community. You've helped to make using Linux even more enjoyable in our house by helping us keep using the hardware we can afford. So this is the perfect email because this is exactly what we talk about on this show. This is what we hope for. We are able to encourage someone to get in there and work on their computer. They did it, which is awesome. And then later on, they had a situation again where it came up and they were able to fix it. They definitely would have had a lot more confidence getting in there the second time. And this is just a skill set that was shared with your son, like Wendy's sharing with her family and something you can just, you know, keep using throughout your life. It's awesome. It gives me a little bit of inspiration to do stuff for myself and maybe go try to find that Xbox 360 and see if I can fix it. You I mean, got this, Michael. I, I mean, it. it's. It, it, I said a little bit gives me inspiration. We'll see what happens because I'm still very lazy. Wendy, so. our telegram is going <laughs> to blow up with, okay, I'm looking at it. What do I do now? That's, that's well, probably not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say that the stock thermal paste is horrible stuff, you are not joking. Everything that I opened this week that I'm looking at thermal paste on, it is an absolute mess. It is everywhere. And then because it is so old, it is a ripping pain to get off. Yes, they make special pads, I'll tell you, that will change your life by Noctua. They come prepackaged, little cleaning cloths, and those will make getting thermal paste off so much easier. Costs a little more, but it's a little trick there that will make your life uh, much better if you're going to be doing that for a lot of machines. I have a few. It came with the thermal paste that I bought because I am using Noctua thermal paste. So they, they are definitely very nice, but when, you know, it's, it's 10 years old and yeah. massively thick and all over everything, it's like, holy crap, why? Yeah. Just why? This episode of Hardware Addicts and the entire Destination Linux network is now sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to making managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. You can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. Or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cents per hour. As Ryan would say, that's darn near free. DigitalOcean also has over 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. Get started on DigitalOcean for two months free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. And we thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode. All right, so now let's get into our core story. There were a few months where we were talking about new processors coming out, and it was really exciting. And now I feel just like we're negative all the time because AMD released the new XT line, and we we're like, eh. And now Intel's dropped a new processor, and I'm like, eh. It's really <laughs> not exciting. Uh, there's a new member to its Comet Lake family. Here we go. If everybody's ready and has a pencil to write this down, it's the i9-10850K. 10,000. Just rolls off the tongue. K. Yeah. So 
obviously very exciting, and this is going to blow your socks off. It's essentially a 100 megahertz slower version of their 10-core i9 10900K. <laughs> it's a 100 megabytes slower version, so who wants it? <laughs> who wants it? Everybody lining up. Well, of course, you know, this is going to be a situation in which they have a yield from the 10900K that doesn't quite hit the specs that they need to by 100 megahertz, apparently. And they're like, hey, let's sell this stuff, which is fine because you're going to give people a big discount, right? No, it's $35 cheaper. <laughs> wow. Just $35. What a deal. Yeah. Some people obviously are saying this is a terrible situation. It's not a good processor to even release. Well, you could release it, but at least put a good discount on it. But Intel's like hogwash. The i9 10850K is based on immediate feedback we've received from customers, including to further expand options and at different price points. I don't think they were like, you know what? If only the 10900K was $35 cheaper... I would be in heaven and 100 megahertz yeah. slower. That would yeah. be it for me. That sounds amazing. I totally want that. It's like you have immediate feedback. They probably want you to have different tiers, not like basically it didn't work out properly, so we'll just go ahead and sell it. Yeah. We're going to keep releasing yeah. them at $5 increments less than the other processors. Great. Thanks. But if they did it so like so excessively where every uh like if they had like the 10 the 10900, right? And they had the 10850 if every they had like ten eight fifty, then ten eight forty, and they just keep knocking off a little bit of money. At least I respect the audacity of it, <laughs> but this is just ridiculous. Person who is researching this sits down and says, "Oh yeah, this thirty five bucks is well saved." No, get the other processor. I mean, at the point where you're like, "Look, I can't even buy my new computer processor I need because I'm I don't have the thirty five dollars." Don't buy a new processor. Save your money, buy food yeah. and other things because the thirty five dollars yes. is the breaking point for you, and you're already in the what four five hundred dollars for the i nine ten nine hundred k might be even more than that. You know, I, I just I don't see it here. This is this is really not a good look for Intel. All right, so in addition to this, I would love to tell you some good news, but hey, they did this, but they've got the 7 nanometer coming out, but that unfortunately in their quarter two earnings was also disappointing news because it's been delayed. They said Again. the company's 7 nanometer base CPU product timing is shifting approximately six more months relative to prior expectations. Primary driver is the yield of Intel 7 nanometer process which based on the most recent data, approximately 12 months behind the company's internal targets for when they expected to have this. And there's more bad news. What? Seriously? They are getting sued over the fact that they are delaying 7 nanometer again. The investors are saying that they have been lied to when they are investing money into the 7 nanometer process. And these continued delays are not only hurting them with the tech world saying, oh my gosh, guys, come on, AMD's done this. It's also the people that are backing them and helping keep the company going are also going, hey, wait a minute, guys, what in the world is going on? That is crazy. And also, it sounds like it's going to be at some point when that in some point soon, the Intel inside will be inside a courtroom. Boom. Ah, well done. <laughs> well, they at least are taking some action. The fallout doesn't stop with just the seven nanometer disaster, but they are moving some people out of the company. Dr. Murthy R., the company's chief engineering officer, is departing the company effective August 3rd. Murthy was uh, picked directly from Qualcomm, but apparently things haven't worked out in the last few years and is kind of uh, taking the fall for all of these delays. They're also breaking up their technology, systems architecture, and client group into five separate teams. They have put Dr. Ann Kelleher in charge of getting 7 nanometer back on track. We're just going to leave you hanging on that one. We have we don't <laughs> know have any idea either, but we're just you, you just you just go with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I went with the Nailed name. It. I assume I pronounced it correctly, but I probably Yeah, yeah, for sure, probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah, I think it was uh perfect. It was a good attempt anyways. Ann started as a process engineer and headed up many things since the time of starting at Intel such as manufacturing and operations. Also holds a PhD in electrical engineering. You know who else holds a PhD in electrical engineering? 
Lisa suit. Yeah. Oh. Now, Dr. Murthy also was an electrical engineer, but he only had a bachelor's degree in the field, not a PhD. So maybe this will make a big difference there. I don't care what's behind their name. If they start on the lower end, so and, and it's not really low, but actually start working on them and helping with that process, it seems to be a really good jump for them to be moving into the head of that. They know how things work. They know what needs to be done. And it seems like such a better way to do it. And the, the nursing program here locally is taught by nurses who worked in the field. The program's fantastic. So why not have somebody who's not only worked on them, knows the ins and outs of it, to help head up an operation like that? That seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before. This is one of the reasons why I think Lisa Sue was such a successful pioneer with AMD and was able to turn the company around is the background, being able to talk the talk with the engineers. And hopefully, you know, this can translate into something for Intel here. Sometimes you just need to put some new people in. Now, I don't know why yeah. everyone else at Intel kind of got away. Now, there was some other movement and things going on, but the CEO is still around, Bob Swan. And they made some interesting announcements at their Q2 results, which, I mean, there is some good news that they did beat expectations for their earnings. So they are making money, and that's an important because the CEO pretty much reports to the stockholders. But they are going to, according to the Taiwan-based newspaper Commercial Times, Intel had, has placed a massive order with TSMC for six nanometer chips. Order is reportedly for 180,000 wafers, roughly the same size order that was placed from AMD. TSMC's leading edge capacity is now reportedly fully booked from companies buying their chips. Is this an outsourcing, basically? Yeah, they're outsourcing it. And the worst part about this, I guess, for in Intel is the Taiwan-based company that they're outsourcing to isn't treating them like a preferred customer. So they're pretty much sure that Intel, once they get their crap together, is going to leave. And so Intel will get their stuff. When Intel gets their stuff, they're not getting priority and other orders that they have with different companies aren't getting pushed back because of Intel. Just in case our lawyers are listening, allegedly all that's happening. Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. Yeah. Yes. yeah. We, we don't, we just, this is what we heard, but mm -hmm. it is interesting because it's, it isn't the whole thing that people touted about Intel was that they did it in house and it wasn't being outsourced. And that's what the, that's what the thing that they mocked AMD for, for a while was because of the outsourcing thing. And now, this is basically flipping it. It is a very interesting times in the processor world because it used to be the exact opposite where everybody was giving a lot of uh, flack to AMD for a variety of different things. And some of these exact same things they're giving to Intel now. The world's flipping on its head. I mean, you have NVIDIA looking at potentially purchasing ARM shares from SoftBank by being a majority holder of ARM. So you'd have NVIDIA, which ARM is so dominant right now. You've got the outsourcing from Intel, which nobody expected to happen. Think about how many years things had to be wrong in Intel and all of the discussions and going out to the stockholders and saying, here's where we're at with this. It's going to come. It's really here and keep failing and failing and failing and not taking these steps beforehand makes me personally wonder why CEO Bob Swan is still around. Yeah, but this is yeah. another one of those places where having somebody who's been on the inside of production can help. Because not only can they talk directly to the people who are building it, they can also talk to the investors and say, no, we need to do it this way because. So we can't do it the fast, quick way and just push something out. If we want to do it right and actually get the company on track and make money, I know I've worked on these before. We have to go about it this way which is, I think, another thing that Lisa Su has been able to do, that person can be a mediator between the tech side of it and the side of it that's looking at it as how do we continue to make this business grow or are we making enough money? They can be a buffer there and help the company actually bring those two sides together. Yeah, it sounds that's an interesting point. And I also think that it sounds kind of like they need to do a little bit more research to gather more intel. 
Wow, uh, Michael. Really, a dad uh, joke oh, at wow. this moment? Uh, wow. Uh, uh, that's what I do here on this show. Just <laughs> just get over it. Well, I find it. it very unfortunate because, honestly, I really like Intel as a company. They have done a lot for open source, which is a project that I'm very passionate about. They've almost really been a leader there above AMD and others in the open source world. And it's sad true. to see, while they did hold this ridiculous monopoly for a while, that they really have nothing to answer AMD back, or ARM for that matter, right now. And they're kind of losing on all fronts. I mean, AMD captured the entire console market out there for gaming, and it's just been one big announcement of partnerships after another, which is just slowly moving Intel out. I like there to be healthy competition, I mean, that's the ideal yeah. world where Intel and AMD and ARM are all battling at kind of rather equal realms. Mm-hmm. One's releasing a processor. It's super exciting. And the next one releases something more exciting. And you just kind of have this great thing for the consumers because the price battle starts to occur. Then right now what we have is AMD just taking them to lunch. ARM's taking them to lunch. NVIDIA is going to take them to lunch, of course, because you got they're going to own ARM there potentially so it's just not good news for intel but i do think they made the right move here if you're not going to be able to get it done in time in-house move it outsource it get some devices out there and then when you get your manufacturing back in line hopefully from this restructuring you can come back stronger but can you imagine where the consumer would be if amd hadn't started making great progress and then intel was in this hole that they're in now I don't even think that Intel would have probably even bothered to start innovating until they had that battle against AMD. Because if you look at what Intel was before AMD started coming up, like the, the, the five years or six years roughly since AMD started like changing drastically, like before that, Intel was essentially the same thing for like five to six years because they had dominance. So it was like slight improvements with iterations that cost a lot of money, but the actual thing you got was not that much better than the previous version. So people oh, always suggest you like just wait two now. Two. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Except now smartphones don't have he- headphone jacks. So innovation. Yes. We right. progressed. This episode of Hardware Addicts is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust. And if you want to check it out, you can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. I've been using Bitwarden for a while now, and I love it. It not only helps me keep track of hundreds of passwords and has random password generation that make it easier to create those passwords. In addition to the great features, Bitwarden is open source software. We talked about how Intel's helping open source for a long time. Bitwarden is doing just that right now, and they are doing something so awesome that they have such a strong level of confidence to open source software at that degree. It is just another reason to make it where I am so excited about Bitwarden. So Bitwarden is so confident in their code that they that they welcome people to dig through it and they even get third-party auditing firms to dig through their code. This is why I made the move many years ago to Bitwarden and also why I think you should too. Bitwarden service is so great that they give you so much for free that you'll probably want to do do what I did and just sign up for the premium account to show your appreciation for their great software, especially since that premium account only starts at like $10 per year. That's right. Ten dollars per year. No, and per with that month. Premium, you mean? I'm sorry. Let me fix no, it. Per month. No, it's per year for per, sure. I per checked. Per year. Yes, exactly. Ten and measly dollars. Ten measly dollars. <laughs> and with one, and <laughs> with that ten measly dollars dollars per year, you get one gigabyte ex- ex- encrypted file storage, two step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, TOTP authenticator storage and generation, and so much more. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. Thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Hardware Addicts and the Destination Linux Network. All right, Wendy, take us into the camera corner and let us know what's going on with Olympus. This is something that's been out for a little while, but I was kind of waiting to cover it until there was a little bit more information. And this news was first brought to me by a community member. So thank you, JJ, for pointing out that Olympus is now no longer going to be manufacturing cameras. There is still some negotiation in the process about them selling off that camera portion. And for people that are now using an Olympus camera, you're left in this situation of, do I have any support? What's going to happen? I've invested in this line with the lenses. Do I need to spend a whole bunch of money? 
to get a new camera system going. And that can be really frustrating because I know we've talked about before with Nikon and them not allowing third parties to work on cameras anymore. It all has to be done in house. They're locking that down. So in a way I was feeling that that same thing as we were going through that, but this could potentially be more devastating. And they said that they stopped creating or they started working on just more professional line of cameras because the cell phone market exploded. Then everybody's got a camera in their pocket and they weren't buying cameras anymore. And I can kind of see going that route of, you know, there's other cameras out there. Everybody's got a phone or a camera in their pocket. So Let's cut out the the lower end devices and only sell sell the professional line, which to me, while on paper, I think it looks good. It really is the entry level cameras that get somebody invested into that line of camera. Think about all of base level DSLRs that have been sold and the, the base level Canons, Nikon, Sony's, that kind of thing. And you get into this camera and you like the way the system works. So as you grow as a photographer and want more out of your camera body, you're already invested into that line of camera and you're moving up in what they offer. And they cut all of that out. Yeah, that's actually so, exactly what happened to me when I got the Sony. It, like and when I started using it and playing with it, I was like, oh, I like a lot of this stuff. And when I found out they had this auto, this really, really slick autofocus, because I have played with it and I have used it and to trying to test to like different features it has. It has a very, very good autofocus that will keep you in focus. Like no matter how far away you are, you could just set it and be done. And that is amazing. And I started like researching it and finding out that they have like one of the best autofocus for videos and even photos. And they even have this thing where it automatically detects your eye and it will make sure that it has the ability to like track you no matter what based on your eye. So your eye was always in focus. And another cool thing that I found out when playing with it, that it has animal eye focus. So you could just tell it that whether you're a person or an animal is the subject. And it will give it this thing where it just tracks instead of having the nose in focus, it has the eye of the animal in focus and it makes it like super sharp. Is that what you have to set it to so it focuses on you? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, my my nose is gigantic, apparently. (laughs) Uh, But yes, uh, why not? Sure. But it's it's a great point that you're saying that, you know, it's entry level is important because that is exactly the reason why I got this. I got the Sony because it was an entry level camera and it also I found out so many different cool things about it that I am now a Sony camera fan. So, I mean, obviously I don't have much experience with it yet, but I have <laughs> like I if I was going to get another camera, I have You're so many reasons with the to Sony get Sony line. Yeah, you, you exactly. know it, you've used it, and you've learned the menu system and things. I, I think that's a good point. I'm really disappointed in you though, Wendy. I, I have to bring this out on the show, and I'm sorry. Um, you could have trolled Michael so well by making him get an Olympus camera. And then we read the story at the end. And you're like, oh, yeah, get a new camera. <laughs> get an Olympus but all, one. <laughs> but that would have ruined the entire intro of the show where I was thanking Wendy for being awesome and helping me. So, I mean, like, is it which one's really worth it? You know, the troll. The troll is worth it. You, you guys <laughs> say that I'm mean and I'm not all as mean as you guys tell everybody I am. Okay, I'll take back part of what I said. <laughs> Just now, part of it. This is sad. Part of I it. mean, you've got a lot of the big camera companies, I think, trying to figure out what they're going to do here. Because, listen, uh, unless they listen to Camera Corner, people don't really understand all the things being thrown out at them, the terms. They don't understand what they're missing by not having a dedicated camera. So people are sold on this idea from Samsung and Apple and others that your camera phone is just as good. It's got that 24 megapixels just like that Olympus camera has, and you're not going to get any better pictures out of it. So I think that a lot of camera companies are probably suffering right now, which is why Nikon, even though their move wasn't something desired by the professional community, is a way of them trying to generate some cash back into the business to say, well, at least we can get some repairs back in house to bring some money in because most people are probably your average family sticking with their cell phone. They really just need to do what, like I think what Sony has been doing with their mirrorless cameras 
is exactly what the companies should be doing is trying to innovate on the but well, not not the budget but the beginner level because it's something that you get people involved in like Wendy was saying and it it shows the the value that you have a camera with it like I before yeah. I got this camera I was using my phone to make videos and then I just got so frustrated with something and I complained about and Wendy and Ryan both said that it would be solved with the regular camera and so I looked into it and I was like, not only is it solved, it's amazing the comparison difference. And it was like the autofocus is the thing that I hated so much on the phone because it would just randomly lose focus. And it's the phone is not even moving like that. The fact that that happens on phones is so ridiculous that that alone is a thing that the company should be promoting about these cameras. It's it just easy to use showing these camera yeah. photos and. Also, the thing that makes Sony such a great value, in my opinion, is the inclusion of the video recording. And a lot of these pro cameras, even the entry level ones that you're spending a lot of money on, you can only record for like 10, 15 minutes, maybe it's 30 minutes, but then it cuts off. And if you've ever done video production for YouTube or anything else, or even recording family events, that's just not enough time. And I think they yeah. should invest in having this all-in-one package where you've got your video camera, you've got your regular camera, and that's what Sony did with this mirrorless, and it makes it such a better value. It does, and it's really sad that Olympus has been around, has been making cameras and lenses since 1936. They are an old camera company, but here's the, the bright side. The Japanese investment fund that they are selling this to, it's not completed, it won't be done until the end of September, maybe the end of this year. But this is one reason why I waited to share this story and kind of share my opinion on it is I wanted to know what comes next, what this investment fund wanted to do with it. And so Olympus has already said, right now we're going business as usual. The camera models that we were working on before, we are still working on, we are still trying to innovate. And the Japanese fund is saying we are going to do our best to continue to put out cameras after this, that all of your warranty stuff is being transferred to us. So there is existing customers are not left out to dry. They are still going to be getting support. So while it may not be directly from Olympus, this camera brand will live on through somebody else. And maybe they'll start having those entry level cameras again. And maybe they will compete more with Sony on that line of, Hey, we've got really good autofocus. We've got video features too. So while it's sad to see Olympus dropping this line and cameras is not the only thing that they do. So Olympus in general is not going away. They're just dropping the camera side of it, but. Somebody else is taking the reins and we may get some great competition out of it. You just that is, that, there. Yeah, that does sound good. It kind of it kind of sounds like potentially that Olympus has fallen, but maybe a phoenix will rise from the ashes. Wow. Pun, less of a dad joke, more of a <laughs> I have to put that movie reference in there. Anyway, go ahead. The worst case scenario is they can just start making medicine like Kodak. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's worse than mine. <laughs> That's it. Our 16th episode of Hardware Addicts is a wrap. Thank you for listening to the show that brings you your bi-weekly tech fix. If you're not all lit up on tech yet, then be sure to check out all the amazing content on the Destination Linux network. Head to DestinationLinux.network and check out all the amazing podcasts and YouTube partners available there. There's so much to fill your brains with, including more Wendy, who has another podcast she's on called DLN Extend which is part of the Destination Linux network. So if you're a fan of Wendy, you can go check that out. And Michael and I happen to be on this podcast that's kind of worldwide and a little bit popular, some would say, pretty pretty popular, called Destination Linux. So you might want to go check that out. Remember, there's no such thing as too much hardware. Learn, build, innovate, and grow. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next week for another awesome Olympic-sized episode that has all the intel or at least whatever intel comes out with in the future that might be outsourced uh, anyway of hardware addicts <laughs> we're not gonna be outsourced yeah we're not outsourced we're here to stay or should we, should we save some money doing that? 
Maybe we'll have to contact Intel and see you what they have. Oh, no, we're going to contact TSMC. Oh, yeah, but I don't. I was, I was talking about getting their like, research to see what they did it so that we could, you know, copy them or whatever. Let's do it. Yeah, it sounds good.